So basically, I'm Rohit, Rohit Fernandez, and I'm going to talk to you about a topic which is, uh, which is in a non-technical perspective. You know, everybody does not have uh, the vision to make money or to become an entrepreneur. Some people are good at what they're doing. Like, like if, sorry, if you ask Ben Johnson or maybe Michael Jordan, a basketball player, you know, start making money overnight, he will not be able to do it. So it's about a person from a non-technical background, how we view the technical field and the problem he's gone through if he is starting a technical startup. So I'm pretty much an illiterate when it comes to technical stuff, though I've done my engineering, I've done my masters, but I've done my masters in supply chain management, which is a completely, completely different field. Not bad. We've got one girl in the house. <laughs> Come on, clap for her. <laughs> but anyway, so I've done my master in supply chain, I, though I did my engineering just around the corner. I'm going to give you a perspective from a non-technical person's view, so what he goes through. Anyway, so we've got the startup called Trade Tantra. Few of them over here have worked on it. Few of them know about it. It's a very new startup. Now I'll tell you my journey of Trade Tantra, what I went through. I'm not going to take too long because the problem is if you take too long and you're boring, then you're both stupid and arrogant. So I'll try and keep it really short. Now, uh, I used to work in the UK. And what my role was, I was a category planner. I worked in supply chain, I bought stuff, and I sold stuff. I did both these things. Now, I independently handled a budget of 20 million pounds, which is roughly 200 crores till last year. I worked for a lot of big projects, the last one being the London Olympics, Paralympic Games. So you can proudly see there was one Indian involved in creating their supply chain, and that was me. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> That's the first time somebody's clapping for that. Yeah, I should have done the Commonwealth Games though, you know. <laughs> Pardon me? Oh, I would have been a billionaire. I wouldn't have been here, no? <laughs> but anyway, so uh, this is what I did. I dealt with suppliers. It was my job was, was to negotiate with them, try and squeeze as much out of them as possible, as in get the cost minimized, and try and get as much out of the customer as possible. So our customers were KFC, Burger Kings, Costas, pret a Starbucks, all big guys. Everything you saw in the UK in any of these stores came through us. I handled the category, water, juices, so any water you bought in the UK came through me. Now, it was my job to interface between these two people. Now, I was fairly good at doing my job. I used to get to work. In one year, I had three jobs, to be honest, and this was my third job. I loved doing it. I stuck on to the job. I used to go in at 9 o'clock in the morning, get it done. Eventually, over a period of time, uh, I realized that I was getting good at it. When I say good at it, I used to finish what I had to do in a day in two hours. What do I do the rest of the time? I used to act like I was working. I look at the computer and just act like I was working. I didn't want more, more work on, but that is extremely boring. I used, to I used to have Crick Info minimized on the side. If India was playing, I keep looking at it. And uh, then I started another thing where I was working four days ahead now. So I used to finish four days work in one day and act like I was working for the remaining three days. Now, the problem with that is we have something called forecasting. How many, of, how many of you all are aware about forecasting? So you're aware about forecasting. So any e-commerce site, any, any, any site which is selling a product has to forecast how many of those products they sell. Anybody who's selling anything who's talking inventory has to decide how much they're going to sell. So yeah, yeah, please, please. You can join him now, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so because it was inventory, you, are you all aware of the cash conversion cycle, the concept of cash conversion cycle? So when you are holding inventory, let's assume you have 10 lakhs worth of inventory. You're holding it to sell it next year. If you keep the same 10 lakhs in the bank, you will get 90,000 as interest. Why would you hold your inventory when you can actually keep it in the bank? So forecasting is a very important thing, especially when you're dealing with bulk volume, about 200 crores. You have to forecast it right. I work quickly, and over a period of time, I realized that things started getting boring. I was doing the same thing every day. I knew exactly what I was doing. There was nothing more to it. So I'm thinking, what should I be doing? What is, I was passionate about what I did, but I did it well. So I need a better incentive to, some, to do something bigger. So I, looked, I was just looking around. And on my right-hand side, in the cubicle, there was this guy called Jerry Duna. He's a Scottish guy. And this guy was exactly like me. Both of us used to fight. We never got along. He was exactly like me. He had a receding hairline. He was balding like me. He was born one day before me, just one day. But he was 10 years older than me. And he was in that company for at least 12 full years, doing the exact same thing. 
he was getting paid more than me because obviously he's been working there forever. But he was doing the exact same thing without any incentive to do it. He was happy with his life. But he used to always crib, you know, what the hell am I doing? I need to bloody do something better. And I, every day I looked at him, I got more and more depressed. I was like, 10 years later, I will be like this guy, four kids, they're just getting paid, just come to work, go back. Nothing else to life, you know. So I started thinking. Now, I know what I'm passionate about. I've decided that this is my line of work. I am the interface between a buyer and a supplier. How can I make that better? How can I make that much bigger? I'm thinking, what is, what is a product which there are a lot of buyers for and a lot of sellers for? And how can I connect them? So the first thing that came to my mind, anybody? What do you think came to my mind? Anyone? What would you think of? The thing that sells the most around the world, where there's a big demand and a big supply also. But there's no way to connect it. The first thing that came to my mind was drugs. I'm like, it's actually drugs, you know, it sells the most. <laughs> So I'm like, not something which I can actually work out on. I can't do this thing. Then again, I'm thinking, what else can I do? What else can I do? Then I thought of alcohol. But the only problem with that is that I would end up drinking most of it. <laughs> so uh, I said, fine. Eventually, I realized that I was the interface. I am a walking, talking interface. I connect buyers and suppliers. I said, why can't we have an online platform to connect buyers and suppliers from around the world? right? Because I was doing that. I dealt with suppliers in Brazil, in Spain, some in India. A funny incident. For the Olympics, I got dal from India, and they found cockroaches in it. I'm not joking. They actually found it. It was called uh, TRS, I think. T TRS was the supplier, an Indian company. But yeah, it was very embarrassing. So uh, I used to deal with suppliers around the world, buyers around the world. So I was the interface. So I was thinking, why not replicate the same thing online? There's another problem when buyers and suppliers are meeting. That problem is, for a supplier, for a person who's selling something, to get a big contract, it'll take anywhere from months to years. So I had suppliers who used to come to meet me. They used to come try and keep me happy. They used to get bottles of champagne, Swiss chocolates. I still didn't give them business, but they used to do it every, every six months or every three months, just to make sure that I remember them. So when there is an opening, when I need a new supplier, I go to them. But it was sad, in a way, because these guys had brilliant products, and I couldn't use it. I just, because I had an existing guy. But these products could have been sold anywhere around the world. And that's when I, that's when I thought, you know, these people can make use of an online, on online interface where they can display their products, they can find buyers easily, depends on how good your product is. And that's when we came up with Trade Tantra. Now, I'm going to talk about my journey to, through uh, Trade Tantra. It's a tongue twister, Trade Tantra. But anyway. Uh, so what happened was, my, my journey through entrepreneurship started way back, when I was in school. When I was in sixth standard, I realized, well, most important thing, when you're starting anything, you check if there is a demand for it. That is the most, you might feel passionately about any product, but check if there's a demand for it. So for a writer, you sell something which people read, not which your friend or your father or your mother would read. You sell something which people read, though you feel passionately about it. So, uh, my first journey started in sixth standard. I realized that my Times of India had changed to a colored version. Now they were giving you a, you know, a sports supplement. How many, of, how many of you are about 28, 29? Anybody? Come on, I know you're 28, 29. See? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, people my age would know that in, when I was six standard, about 12 years old, long back, uh, Times of India started a sports edition which had a very glossy finish. And there were a lot of sports fanatics in my class. Now, I hated sports people because I was getting paid to work. They were getting paid to play. Who pays people to play, man? <laughs> but anyway, so these people, diehard fans, these sick posters of Sachin, all these sports people on their walls and all that. So I started this thing where I used to cut out, you know, the picture of the sports person from this extra supplement, and I used to sell it in class. Now, money was banned in class. I would have got belted if I was taking money. So. I, my concept of richness was collecting cricket cards. So back then there was a bubble gum called Big Fun. I don't know if you all have heard of it, Big Fun. Big Fun came with a, it was a one rupee Big Fun, which came with a cricket card. And the more number of cricket cards you have in class, you're the king, man. Seriously, when the chicks used to approach you, they used to say, oh, how many cards do you have? Oh, I have so many cards, you know. Okay, 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 I thought there, was, there were no girls here. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, anyway, number of cards was the value of your richness. So I started, I said, okay, fine. 
I will sell this and I will allocate a price to it. I will tell you how many cards you have to give me. So I got it to class. I said, okay, this is 10 cards, this is 12 cards. The bigger, the better the quality. So uh, people started paying up. Soon, every Tom, Dick, and Harry in class started getting Times of India. And they all started selling the exact same thing what I was selling. That was competition. Now I need a better USP than them. I, I'm not a Marwadi, but I started thinking like one. <laughs> so uh, I started thinking, now what is the USP? You know, how can I actually do better than these guys? Because they're selling the exact same product, the exact same picture, which I'm selling, but I can't compete. So I was thinking, I was thinking, that's when it struck me, you know, in school, people don't have too much money. So I started a credit limit. So I said, you know what, you can pay me, take a week's time, pay me after a week. I will give you a credit limit of 100 rupees, that means 100 cards. You can buy up to that much, but you have to pay me in a week's time. He said, fine, excited, my customer base started increasing. So uh, there was this friend of mine called Vinay, I go, he doesn't like me that much, but uh, I like him. He was my, one of my most valued customers back then. So when I came and he bought the cards, he was all, no, the, bought the cutouts, very excited, very happy. He buys all, the, all these cutouts, he tells me, okay, you know what, I'll, give you, I'll pay you in a week. I was like, yeah, dude, don't worry, I'll, I'll collect the money. A week passes by, next Monday I go to him, I'm like, macha, cards, dude. So he's like, hey, dude, I don't have money, dude, I'll, I'll pay you two days, two days. Huh? Now that's when I realized people don't pay on time. So uh, I said, okay, fine, two more days. Two days later I go to him, I'm like, when I, cards. They, dude, no money, dude. I said, nothing doing, you've taken my product, you better pay me for it, you have to pay me for it. So when I say it's fine, so you know what Vinay does? Vinay goes home, opens his dad's cupboard, pulls out his dad's wallet, and he's pulling out a 100 rupee note to buy big fun. When he's pulling out the 100 rupee note, his dad catches him. Hey, what are you doing, man? What are you doing? Why are you taking the 100 rupee note? So Vinay's like, hey, our daddy, Rohit, here, daddy. Rohit wanted 100 rupees, I have to pay him and all that. Gone. That was the end of my entrepreneurship career. <laughs> My parents got to know, my principal threatened to kick me out. They thought I was like Munna Bai in school. I wasn't. I was doing a decent business. So your ecosystem should be supportive. Otherwise, you need to be very strong. The second incident was, I'm not going to tell you about the incident because it will land me in a lot of trouble. I studied close by. We came up with this concept in engineering. Huh? See, I was not a tech guy. We came up with this concept where without asking a person for money, without selling a product, without begging for money, without doing anything, we still get money. So what we did was, we get, kept an Assamese guy near the canteen. And he was just standing there, and people used to come and give him money. And we collected 20,000 rupees in one day. There are people here who will vouch for me, because they were involved. But we made 20,000 rupees in one day. So there are ways of, because people are waiting to give you the money. You need to know how to extract it without doing anything wrong. It's not about the money. I'm not saying it's always about the money. It's about what you're passionate about. But there are people, you know, in Bangalore, people have extra cash. They don't mind shelling it out. You need to use the right technique. So I've always been an entrepreneur. I've just been doing Mandwali. What's, that's what they call it, I think, in Bombay. I've been doing it for a bit. Coming back to uh, trade tantra. So when I was working, I realized that there was a potential for this product. And in about uh, 2012, I realized that I need to start it. I need to start it because at any given point of time, there are at least about nine people who are thinking the exact damn same thing, what you are thinking. And I'll tell you, it happened also. Uh, so I was thinking, I said, you know what, we need to do it. And I've always believed in a concept of kick-starting things. If it doesn't happen, force it to happen, you know? So I contacted this friend of mine. I was not willing to quit my job. It was a big risk for me because back then, I was earning 60, 60 lakhs per annum. We had just finished the Olympics contract and come down to 45. It was still a lot of money for me. So I decided to set aside one lakh every month to, uh, towards trade tantra, to get people to work on trade tantra. So I contacted a friend of mine in Bangalore. Now when I contacted this guy, I said, dude, listen, he had quit his job at Yahoo, so he was a technical guy, not very technical, but decent. He studied with me. So I said, we need to do this thing. What do you think about the idea? He said, great idea. I said, I'll pay you whatever is required. I'm sitting in the UK, I will fund you. You need to start it for me in one year. In 2013, I will come back. Things went on, he kept trying. He's like, dude, I'm trying to find vendors, programmers, trying to build a team. Nothing happened. For one full year, nothing happened. So after that, now I'm still thinking. Nothing has happened one year. I decide in November 2012, I decide, you know what, it's time I quit my job. You have to be on the ground to make anything happen because it is your product. You feel passionately about it. So I came down. 
I told I didn't tell my parents I was quitting my job because then they would never let me come down. I had to break up with my girlfriend because she wanted to get married to me and I didn't have a stable source of income. Now, she's a lovely girl, a lovely girl, no other reason, honestly. But uh, I had to. She wanted, I, I didn't have a steady source of income, I was quitting my job. All my savings were dedicated only towards one thing. So I come down. Last year, same time, I'm in India. One month I screw around, you know. Now I think I'm an NRI, I'm spending in pounds, so I have fun for one month. After that, I start Pray Tantra. My first thing was to find vendors. Now in Bangalore, what I've realized about vendors, no offense to people who are running companies, no offense to anybody, I met about 20 vendors over a period, period of three months. My priority was cost, quality, and giving me the right thing. I didn't have a UI, UX design in mind. I had nothing. I knew what it had to do. I had a detailed requirement document. That's about it. Now, I'm a non-technical person, right? How am I supposed to know about it? So I look at different vendors. So there were some who were giving me a quote of 25 lakhs to some who gave me 4 lakhs. Big variation. So what I realized was for the same product, for the same amount of work, you've got a massive variation. And how is that justifiable? Because these were not TCS or Infosys. These were regular companies. The second thing I realized was a lot of companies hire about 100 people to work for them. You'll pay them only five or 7,000 rupees. It is like a sweatshop. You know sweatshops in China, you just do this. That's it, that's their job. So it got to an extent where I could, I was talking, I was having a smoke with this person who worked for one of these companies. And I said, so what, what really happens here? He was not very happy with the place. So he said, it gets so bad sometimes that the person to create, say, a logging in section, he will Google how to create a logging in section. And he will copy and paste the code and give you exactly what you want. And that is not what I wanted. Because I'm paying for something, I want the best possible quality out of it. So again, I was still looking, I asked a few friends. Finally, I found a vendor. He came recommended. So people vouched for him, saying, yeah, he's done a decent job. He's done a few things for, you know, Infosys, and he's worked on big projects. I said, fine, he's worked with Infi, he showed me his work. He had done some complex stuff, perfect. So I met this guy. Another thing when you're dealing with a supplier, which I've noticed from my past, is you should know how to keep control of them. As in, you should know how to get extract work out, out of them. But because this guy was a professional in his field and I wasn't, I said, fine, you know what, let's leave it to the professionals. When it comes to supply chain, I know how to do it best. When it comes to technical stuff, he knows best. So uh, simultaneously, when I was looking for vendors, I found a UI UX guy, an IITN, and he did, he did the UI UX design for me. Now all I had to do was give the UI UX design to the vendor and say, you know, replicate this. What I did not realize was the compatibility between these two entities is most important. The, you, the vendor used to tell me, hey, this is not implementable, I can't do this. He, I used to go back to the UI, UI UX guy and this guy by then he had gone to Denmark. I'm actually calling him on Skype and I'm saying, dude, this guy is saying you can't, he can't do it, why don't you change it? He's like, you'll have to pay me extra to change it. I said, yeah, but he's saying you can't implement that. So I was the interface between these two guys and it was pathetic because they had no working compatibility. So it's very important that when you're creating a team, or even if you're using freelancers, make sure that there is enough compatibility between these people, right? So uh, whatever, somehow we got it sorted out. Now the vendor gives me a HTML view of the entire thing. I don't know, I know what HTML is, but I'm not very well versed with what technology does. So I saw it, it was a, it was a fairly good replica of what the UI UX guy had given, loved it. The second problem with the entrepreneurs who feel very passionately about their product is the slightest thing will make them very happy. Hey, macha aagi de. You see, it finished. But the truth is, there is a lot to be done. So I saw the HTML view. I tried searching for something. It didn't work. So I called the vendor. I said, dude, not working. He's like, no, no, that's only the static site. He tells me on the phone, it's only a static site. Work is going on. I said, fine. So when are you going to complete it by? He gives me a date of the 6th of December. 6th of December. I said, fine, 6th of December, this was, by then it was September, late August, early September. Fine, by the 6th of December, he's giving me the product with all the bugs solved, testing is done, everything under, under the sun is done. I say, okay, no problem. Now, every, like every 10 days, I'm curious to know how much has happened, what has been done with the product. I call him, I'm like, dude, could you show me what's been happening, a little bit at least. He's like, listen, we programmers don't like being bothered. I don't want to put pressure on my programmers. See, I have no offense to anybody, but that's what he told me. And I said, okay, maybe true, you know. They don't want to be bothered. I said, I'll wait. But every 10 days, I used to ask him. 
because that's my job. I paid him money. I pay, I paid him one half in advance, and uh, the other half after completion. So I kept asking. Gate approached, 6th of December, D-Day. Now I go to him, I go to the office, I'm like, oh, yeah, so 6th of December, been calling you almost every 10 days, show me what you've got. Like, Rohit, there's a slight problem. The thing is, we will need a little more time. I said, okay, fine, little more time is, is warranted, because everything, every project, you know, you have a contingency plan. So in project management, you have the critical path method. Oh, that's the supply chain. I'm sure CPM and Perth, in engineering, we, are, we had it. And then there's a contingency plan where you force things to happen the right way, where it's gone wrong. I say, fine. Uh, so how long would you take again? He said, 22nd of Jan. That's almost two months. Huh? It's been about six months since I've come down. And my parents are asking me every day, hey, what are you doing sitting at home? Go do something. And I'm actually meeting vendors. I'm doing something. But they don't understand the concept. They've been very supportive. They've been feeding me till now. So I've put on weight. But other than that, they obviously nag. They're parents after all. So it's bound to happen. Anyway. So 22nd of Jan, I'm waiting, I'm still asking him. By then he started showing me little, little things, you know, with my product, saying, oh, this is working, oh, that is working. And I used to get very excited, you know, oh, this is working, oh, that is working. So I'm like, how much more time? Another 10 days, another five days, that sort of thing. And 22nd of Jan approached, so I'm like, dude, where's the product? And he's like, dude, uh, we've had a slight problem. My uh, programmer got married. I'm like, dude, what's my... Uh, what can I do if your programmer gets married, man? He's like, no, he got married, so a little busy. I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> little busy. So anyway, he, he claimed to have about four programmers. I said, what are the other three doing? By then, it was unbearable because I've lost seven months. I'm in India. Technically, I was losing 45 lakhs per annum because I've quit my job. Before that, I used to even get proposals when I was in the UK. Now, nobody wants me. It was that bad, huh? So... Uh, I've told him, I, I told this guy, I said, see, nothing doing, I want to meet your programmers. And believe it or not, that's when I realized there were no programmers. There was nobody. What he used to do was he used to get about three, four guys from who work for other companies full time. He used to ask them for a little time of theirs in the evenings and he used to get them to do the work. One of them got married, so in the evenings he has no time. Whereas the others were not working in the evenings. So I said, nothing doing, give me the numbers. Now comes the concept of force starting. I said, I will deal with it. So I called these guys. Once everybody picked up my call, just once. After that, they knew my number. They stopped picking up my calls totally. I started emailing them. No response. Now, I've got, you who know the concept of Hotte Hori? How many of you all know Kannada here? Yeah, see, I had stomach burn, you know, because I've paid. I've paid. I don't have my product. I don't know where it is going. I was between a rock and a hard place, like that guy from 127 hours, no? I'm stuck. I do not know what to do. I've just lost everything. It, it was a very, very bad part. You know, I had to come out of it. Even now when I think of it, I get goosebumps because I did not know who to ask. My friends try to help, but they've got other, other things to do, you know. So I said, this shit is not happening. I need to get this shit started. So one day I decided, it's my way or the highway, you know. I will do it. I pulled up the vendor. I said, nothing doing. We need to join. Whatever's happened has happened. Your programmers are not responding to you, not responding to me. I have paid you. You've got two options. You give me my money back. Honestly speaking, I did not want my money back. Because by then, I've lost seven months of my life. And if you give me my money back, I've actually lost all seven months. You get my point? There's nothing. We go back to zero. I said, nothing doing. We are going to cover up for the seven months of work, hook or by crook, somehow. So we started getting freelancers. Now, it was his job to get freelancers because I've paid him the amount. So he got a freelancer from Delhi. Unfortunately, my vendor is a Tamilian who knows only English and Tamil. And that guy is a Delhiite who knows only Hindi. So my Hindi is broken. And they could not communicate. But he was the cheapest. We found him on the internet somewhere. So now I'm having a conference call between one guy in Delhi and one guy in Bangalore. This guy talks to me in English. I'm like, so aap ye karo, aap ye upload karo. So I'm actually trying to talk to him in Hindi. Somehow, I realized that time one thing, that some freelancers, if you ask them to do X, they will do exactly X. So there was one module where they had to upload product images, right? So when you're uploading a product image, common sense, you compress the image. So if it's a 10 GB file, you don't upload 10 GB, right? You compress it. The second thing is, you have thumbnails to scale it to exactly what you want, like Facebook. You've got an image which is long. You cut it, scale it, such that it fits on your site. So I said, dude, we need this uploading module done in Hindi. Mujhe ye, dude, uploading module karo or whatever. 
and uh, I'm talking to this guy, so I'm telling him. He's like, yeah, no problem, I'll do it. About a week's time, he does it. So he shows me. I'm like, yeah, but it's uploading about what, 10 MB and all that. Apne uploading bola tha. Now ab change mat karo it seems. <laughs> I'm like, dude. So I said, okay, nahi, compress karna padega na. I don't want to annoy him because if he runs out again, I'm stuck with zero. So I'm like, uh, acha, to kitna extra ap ye karo me extra de dunga. So he said another seven grand. He will do the compression part and all that. I said, fine. Pay him another seven grand. I paid three five in advance. And I said, okay, do the compression part. So he did the compression part. I said, Magar, either scaling nahi hota hai. Hey, aapne scaling nahi bola tha, it seems. <laughs> I'm like, damn. So I need to bloody document everything. But somehow I got him to do it. Scaling has not yet been done. So if you're on a site, you'll notice somebody this long will be compressed like this, you know. So scaling hasn't been done. We are working on it. And uh, finally, I said, okay, screw it. I'm not going to work with you. First of all, you're somewhere in the middle of, you know, in Delhi, I can't keep control of you. Funny enough, even he was getting married. I'm not joking. He, he got married on March 3rd. He called me for his wedding. I think I sponsored his wedding that week. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so now I started looking for programmers in Bangalore. Now in Bangalore, I started asking people rampantly. Believe it or not, people introduced me saying, hi, this is my friend. Yeah, do you know PHP? Yeah. And that is how I used to meet people, you know. Believe it or not, it was bad. The two guys over here also I met in the course. I mean, course of finding programmers. Ashrit and Mr. Amitav. Hey, raise your hands, man. Don't feel shy. So I met these guys in the course of looking for programmers. I met them at a coffee shop. Check. It didn't go through for different reasons. Uh, they had their college and all that. But anyway, I was looking for programmers actively. I didn't call them here. Huh? They came by themselves. See? Uh, anyway, so I was still looking for programmers. Eventually, I find this guy. In my, I'm looking at my phone. And any person I meet who knows PHP, I see him in the name as PHP. So I was looking PHP, PHP, Deepak, PHP, Arun, PHP. And I realized there was one PHO. There's a typing error, you know, a typo. So I said, oh, this PHO is actually PHP. And he's one guy I haven't called yet, you know. So I called this person. His name is Deepak. I don't know if he's here. No, he's not here. He's supposed to be coming. So I gave Deepak a call. I said, dude, listen, uh, I got your number from, I didn't know where I got his number from. I, from a friend of mine. And uh, I needed this thing done. So he's like, yes, I remember. He spoke to me a few months ago. So I said, yeah, so you, the project which I was talking about, it's almost there. But I needed to work on it. So I gave him a module. I said, will you be willing to come on board full time? So by then, I realized one very important thing. That in any venture, it might be technical, non-technical, it's important to have a co-founder because now two people are bouncing off ideas, right? So risk is always minimized because unless both of you are identical, people are bound to be different. And when two people are viewing one thing, they look at it from different perspectives. And that automatically minimizes your risk, right? So uh, whatever. So that's when I realized I needed a co-founder, especially a technical co-founder, because I had jack shit about knowledge about what was happening. So I spoke to Deepak. He said, no, I'm working for a, I will work, but my charges are $30 an hour. I said, boss, $30 are not happening. I've already lost a lot of money. I'll give you one module. Work on it on a freelance basis. He said, fine. So I gave him one module, and he, he did a decent job. So that time he told me how bad the code was. My architecture, I'm sorry to use it. No children, no. My architecture was fucked. It was so bad that it was irreparable. So he said, I can't work with this code. It's total haywire. So I said, do something, please. I've paid you. Try and do something. I actually begged him. That's when I realized programmers were gold. In fact, they're not gold. They're uranium, you know. They're explosive. Actually, uranium is not explosive, but whatever. They are radiation prone. I, I don't know, whatever. So uh, programmers were gold for me. They were very important. So I told him, I begged him, I said, do it. And he was a lovely guy. He helped me out with it. He started working on his module. I asked him if he knew anybody else, any other programmer. So he gave me a number of another person called Panindra. And I'm from Mangalore. Mang well, I was born and brought up here, but originally from Mangalore. If I know anybody else is from Mangalore, I got very, get very excited. Understandable. So he gave me the number of this guy called Panindra Bhatt, who's sitting there. Panindra, dashy young man, the two ladies in the audience, he's single. <laughs> so. Uh, I met Panindra. I told Panindra. Panindra was even more expensive. Huh? He was charging a lakh a month. I said, Macha, what lakh a month? OK, fine. I'll charge 25,000 rupees. Like, hey, not bad for one week. That is technically a lakh a month, man. So uh, I give Panindra the project. And Panindra looks at it. He's like, I should have told you this before. I can't work with this code. 
So till then I used to think one man's code is another man's poison. But now I realize my code was actually bad. So anyway, Panindra took it up. He said, no, you know what, I'll help you out here. I'll work on it. As he was working on it, I think, I think, I'm talking for you here. I think, see the guy with the specs, black shirt. <laughs> so I think he started believing in the product. Now it's very important. Now when you're getting a co-founder on board, he's sacrificing a lucrative deal. He might get a full-time job in a big company or another startup which is paying him much better. He will be sacrificing that to come and join you. So he does not have to believe in the idea. He needs to believe in you. So that is the trick about finding a technical co-founder or a co-founder in any sense because he needs to believe in you that you can drive this product forward. Right? So I get Panindra on board. And we decide the stakes and all that. And about uh, a month ago, we became partners. The product is almost there. So uh, we launched the product recently, uh, about on the 4th and 5th of uh, March in Coimbatore. Pitched it to only 50 customers. Out of, and it's a free product. Huh? Out, of which 50 custom, out of 50 customers, 25 of them paid us for it. It's 10 million, so there was a uh, uh, thing gap, like you know, talking gap, whatever, communication gap. But they paid us for it. So that's when we realized this product will sell. And Panindra had already come on board. And now we have, there are a few bugs. I'm not saying no, the product is out there. So over this entire period, I realized one thing. That it's difficult to find a co-founder, very difficult. You need to be very wise. You need to be checking exactly what is happening with your product. Otherwise, it'll just get destroyed. And most importantly, how to take a calculated risk. Because you might feel passionately about anything in the world, but, but is it worth sacrificing everything for this one thing? Over a period of all this, believe it or not, though I love this product, I'll get married to it if I have to, you know. I love this product so much. Every single day, I should doubt it. I should say, whatever I have sacrificed, is it really worth it? You have friends who will come and say, after 10 years they meet you, and they don't want to find out how you're doing. Macha, how, where, where are you working? You have to package. That's all they want to know. Your friends are drinking at Shiro's, and you are going to sit in some local bar, because you can't afford Shiro's. Now you're sacrificing everything. Is it really worth it? And most importantly, at home, people, my folks are very supportive. But there, there comes a point when they see, you know, Neighbors, kids, hey, what, in the US? I was in the UK for damn four years, you know? I was working for four years. I studied there before that. That didn't matter any longer. Now I'm a zero. I, no, I am a zero. I'll give you another example, you know? Our ecosystem, we think. Well, right now, Bangalore has changed quite a bit. From in the last four, five years, Bangalore has changed quite a bit. But when I was doing engineering, 2004 to 2008 in CMRIT, the Victoria, not Victoria, what does VT stand for? Vishweshwarya. I've been in the UK a little longer, I think. <laughs> so, uh, Vishweshwarya Technological University. I, dude, engineer bad. <laughs> but anyway, the VTU had banned mobile phones. They have completely banned mobile phones. And that's when the mobile phones were becoming the next generation of technology. Smartphones were coming in. And believe it or not, my entire batch and my few of my juniors and seniors lost out on that op opportunity. Now when I'm, now we're recruiting, we're trying to recruit other programmers, we're talking to students. I see students now have a much greater advantage to people from my batch. My batch students came out, then studied PHP. They took about a year and a half, you know, doing well at it or, you know, gaining their expertise. And after that, they considered themselves to be good programmers. Whereas in my time, all we had were mobile phone checks. They used to randomly walk into class, hey, pockets, pockets. And they used to actually take our mobile phones, because of which none of us use mobile phones. And my batch lost out on the opportunity of making money on mobile phone. Now there's every random person who's starting an app, and a good app. Whereas my guys are working in Infi, in TCS, in Wipro, and that's it. They get 30000 a month. They're happy with their life. Not because they want to be, because they did not have an option. So your ecosystem, at times, will try and put you down. You need to kick it back, and you need to push it further. So. Uh, I don't know what else to talk about. That's about it. This is my journey about Trade Tantra. And uh, if you all have any questions, personal, non-personal, you want to abuse me, you can do that right now. I'll be outside after this. If there are any young, uh, if some people, can, if people think they can help me out here, you're more than welcome to come and give me some advice. If you think I can help you, I give talks in supply chain all over the country. IITs, regular places, universities, government colleges, and, uh, organizations. So if you all want to know anything about supply chain e-commerce, 
or about trade tantra, about how we can help you, please let us know. Panindra, there, Panindra? Yeah, technology. He's like a proper risk kid, you know. Seriously, he's like the Harry Potter of the technology industry. Anyway, and anything about trade tantra, supply chain, about the shit I've gone through, please come and ask me. Any questions? Dude, questions, you would? <laughs> no, you can ask me any questions. Well, not bad, I took 40 minutes, people. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> well, for honestly, the first time, I'll tell you what happened. So I was in the UK, and UK has a lot of pretty women, but not, I didn't break up because of that. Huh? <laughs> I was in the UK, and I decided to quit my job. And this lovely girl, it might sound like I get bored of things quickly, but I was dating her for the last nine years of my life, and that's a long time. Huh? It is the hardest thing I had to do. She wanted to get married. Now I told her, she was, she was okay with me starting up and getting married. But I did not know. See, I'm living off my parents right now. I've got savings. I've got, I've got decent savings, which is funding trade tantra. But I, do, I use my mother's car. I use my, my dad's got a, he runs a business. I get my fuel reimbursed from my dad's company. But my savings is only for trade tantra. And I was not willing to give that up for anything. So she said, you need to get married. I said, fine. But the problem is, I've quit my job. Money is an issue. I will get married to you, but tomorrow there are two things that might happen. Either I will tell you that you ruined my life, because of you now I have to focus on family, or you will tell me I ruined your life. It will work both ways. And I, I, did not, I genuinely did not want that to happen. So I said, you know what, unfortunately, we have to break this off. After nine full years, huh? people, people think I'm married to her now. Hey, much I'm married. Huh? Dude, what's wrong with you, man? We broke up. So uh, now I meet her on and off. It's extremely, extremely tragic. She's not married yet. She's looking for a guy. A much chance, well, she won't get anybody <laughs> like this. <laughs> but she's looking for another guy. We're just friends now. But yeah, so the girl's out. No girls now. I'm single, just like Panindra. <laughs> so uh, that's about it. Yeah, that's about the girl. Uh, like starting a company is like giving birth. <laughs> baby is easy. Starting a company. <laughs> Is like giving birth. <laughs> See, the thing is, uh, when you have money, when you have lots of money, when you have uh, easy cash, cash injections, then it's, diff then it's easy to rep you know, multiply that money. For example, I know a guy, a friend of mine, who's working for Sunil Mittal, Airtel guy's son, where any bank is actually begging that guy to take loans from them. Hundreds of crores. He has nothing. He doesn't even have fixed assets. Nothing. But the big banks are begging them to take money. Whereas in my case, I will have to mortgage my house, my farmhouse, my cars, my dad, myself. Only then will I get some money out of it. So starting a company, see, everyone has ideas here. Turning the idea into reality is a risk. And you need to weigh that risk properly. You have to think about different factors, girlfriend being one. You have to think about your parents. You have to think about what are you going to do. So I looked at it this way. I said, see, when I quit my job, I was 27. I was young. I quit my job last year, so yeah, I was 27 when I quit my job. I, well, I just turned 27. So I said, you know what, I can afford to lose about a year of my life. I will give this everything I have, everything. Maybe, maybe two years. And if I, don't, if I don't succeed, and failure is a part of it. See, people say, learn from your failures. That's bullshit. Because your failure will tell you what not to do. It will not tell you what you should be doing. You get my point? You need to know what you should be doing not what you shouldn't be doing. So uh, anyway, it's about, well, it, you have to take all these things into perspective and then take the right decision. I knew if in two years nothing worked out, I could get a job. I wouldn't do as well, but I knew I could feed myself. And even before quitting, I said, you know what, am I going to die of, out of hunger? I don't live in Somalia. My parents will feed me. I know that for a fact. So I took the risk. I said, you know what, I can't take the risk. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who can't who must be having brilliant ideas, 100 times better. But the ecosystem kills them. I'll get, give you another difference between the UK, the US, and India. Here, if you're bankrupt, you, nobody gives a fuck. Seriously, nobody cares, you know? Nobody cares. Whereas in the UK, you have children? Oh, you know what? We'll give you childcare. You have, uh, well, you don't have a job? We will give you a house, and we will pay you not to have a job. Now, that is support. So you have entrepreneurs who are willing to take that risk because they know. They have nothing to lose. They can always get back on their feet. The government supports them. I'm not saying the government should support us. All I'm saying is, 
we as people in this country need to take wiser decisions than a lot of other people abroad. Anything else? Sorry, yeah. See, I, I spoke to people about it. Uh, I was told one thing, simple and straight, that for funding, because most of the VCs are like Marwadis. So for funding, they, what they want is they want traction. They want people to validate your product, then they will validate it. And once a VC shuts his door on you, he will not look at you again. So we are going, we are going to, we are pitching for funding soon, within the next three, four weeks. And we, we're trying to get interviews now. But our aim, see my product is not the most sturdy, but it is decent. It works, it does what it has to. We are going to scale it, but to scale it, we need funding. I've got savings, but we need to, to scale it to that level, we need funding. And what we've decided is, when the product was almost done, we validate, validated it with genuine customers. So I realized one thing, my target audience were not just big companies. They were small fellows who were doing welding also, you know. They wanted to be, have a presence on the net. You have, you have business directories, you have India Mart, you have Alibaba, Alibaba is big, huh? but you also have Trade India, you know, all these yellow pages, Just Dial, they are all directories, but they are not an interface which will help these people work. You get my point? And they fleece the average customer, whereas I wanted something where everybody has a presence on the web, and that was the point of doing it. So we have not funded, we will be going for funding now, sorry. What is the I forecast. Oh, hey, dude, are you a VC? No. Hey, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Uh, well, see, there are, if I if I compare myself to say Alibaba, Alibaba has got million, 45 million registered users, and millions of paid users. They've got they've just entered India with 9,000 paid users, and they charge two lakhs per annum, right? Similarly, we've got Trade India and India Mart who charge. These guys fleece the shit out of you. They will charge anywhere between 28,000 to 20 lakhs, depending on what you want. So I want more, okay, fine, you pay another lakh, another lakh. That's how they increase. If I give you my, if I actually give you my forecast, you will say it's unbelievable because it is un unbelievable. What we are trying to do is we are trying to reach out to every company at zero cost. We charge, we're still charging them because we need to keep it genuine. We don't want people to unnecessarily come and create accounts and ruin business for other people. We're charging them a very nominal amount, which is less than a thousand bucks just to get on the site so that we know where he's coming from. So the number is big. But the question is, are we going to achieve it or not? How do you validate So basically, uh, we had a trade show. At the trade show, we put up a stall. I got one guy who knew Tamil. <laughs> I had to say that because it was in uh, Coimbatore. And at that place, we started telling people what the product was and would they be interested. That way, I tried to recognize who my target audience was. For example, a garment enterprise. So you had HEL helicopter division there. You had a lot of big companies there. A government enterprise, he's like, why should I pay 200 bucks, 300 bucks from my pocket for this? You know? So I know a government em enterprise or an employee who is not a salesperson, who is not driven to sell that product, will not pay for it. Unless you're a big brand, people know you. On the other hand, I realized that there were small guys, guys who were worth, whose turnover was less than like 10 lakhs, who were willing to pay for it because now they wanted a presence on the internet. They said, you know what, for a cheap price, if it's giving me visibility, why not, right? So that, that's when we validated the product. Another key thing was to decide what value we need to keep. How much to charge? I'm not, telling you, I'm not going to tell you how much we're going to charge because that is still, uh, you know, we're still going through it. But over there was an excellent platform to understand how much people were willing to pay. So first guy said, boss, 2,000 bucks. The second guy said, boss, 100 bucks. You know, we were checking. And we realized what people were willing to pay happily. And another thing I did, now this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. Out of the people who registered, three people, I did not register them. I wanted to see out of these three people, how many people would call me saying, I've paid you this amount. Why haven't you registered me? So out of them, only one called back, only one. The other two said, hey, it's a small amount, forget it. So I knew people were willing to pay. I'm not going to, I've registered them now. So now they're on the site. I send them the link and all. But I waited for about two weeks, three weeks after that, just to see whether they called me. So one person called me, and that person was actually, they do uh, dyes and tools and all, things like that. One person called me. Now she keeps calling me, and she, she wants to know how to use the site. And she speaks Tamil. She's not very tech savvy. And I try to explain it to her. You know, this is the logging in section. It's, it's fairly straightforward. But for a person who's not tech savvy, 
So, you begin to understand where the problems are. And because it's an enterprise tool, you know, enterprise tools, there's a standard rule, it looks shitty. I know I'm in SAP, but SAP is, uh, if you look at the uh, UI UX, <laughs> dude, trust me, I will not want to work on that. I w oh, S hey, dude, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, no, but I worked with SAP, I worked with AX, uh, Microsoft AX Dynamics, I worked with JD, uh, AS400, I worked with a whole load of ERPs. And ERPs are bad because all you give a shit about is, sorry, time is up, is it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, you're all hungry, yeah? I'll finish up. So all you give a shit about an enterprise tool is whether it works or not. You don't give a shit about anything else. So that's why enterprise tools can be bad looking. We want to make our enterprise tool good looking because we don't work at SAP. So, <laughs> but anyway, guys, I'll be around. If you have any questions, please come back. The guys who are hungry, you can go eat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, man.